Hey, people, can you hear me? Hear me good? All right, nice. Hi, welcome. It's lovely to see all of you here. Uh, thank you for spending your Monday evening. Um, you could be at home relaxing and watching Netflix, but no, you came here to see Drawing Robots, which is also really cool. Um, so I'm going to give you a little brief tour of early plotter art from a very specific era when computer graphics was really new. So uh, we're talking the 1960s to 1970s. There's a whole lot of stuff that has happened since then until today, but I chose to focus on this very early era because it's really interesting and it's really nice to see where we came from. So before I start, uh, just a little introduction about myself. My name is Sherman. It's a two-word first name, um, like Mary Jane, and you'll be surprised at how many online forums are really upset about that white space in your first name. Uh, yeah, and my parents are like, oh, you know, one N is not, you know, unique enough, so let's put two Ns. Um, so there are a lot of variations where things can go wrong. But uh, on the bright side, I'm the first search result on Google. So <laughs> you look me up, you know, so benefits of having a weird name. Um, and by my accent and my name, you can probably tell I'm not from around here. I'm actually from a small country in Southeast Asia called Malaysia, and it's literally on the other side of the world. And I'm realizing now the contrast on this is very Hi, so you can't see the rest of it, but like you can see, yeah, I promise everything else is like relatively high contrast, so you know, if it looks weird, just, just direct your attention to the screens on the left and right. Um, and I am actually living in New York City right now as a web, and I work at a company called Teachers Pay Teachers as a web platform engineer. So I do front end uh, infrastructure, and uh, the company is an education and marketplace for teachers to share their resources. So a little bit about me. Um, and I also want to take this opportunity to plug something called the Rika Center, uh, which is a program programming community in New York City. And it's personally one of my most favorite programming communities uh, out there because it's a place that is uh, educational, it's self-directed. And you can think of it as a programming retreat where if you want to go and you know, scratch an itch you've had for years or just take time off work to focus on learning something new to be a better programmer, uh, you should check it out. Uh, you can take either one week, six weeks, or 12 weeks off to do this. And I'm not being paid to plug this. Uh, the only reason why I mention it is because the programmer I am today is due to that experience at the Recruit Center. And all my talk today is also uh, a result of my time there. So definitely check it out. Um, and now let's talk about plotters. So plotters, uh, we've seen some really cool examples of them on the gallery and uh, on the table at the back there. And for those of you who are new to plotters, I like to think of them as mechanical drawing robots. So you have a uh, arm that can hold a pen and move across a surface and create marks. And um, as Carl mentioned, uh, you can make you know, really interesting art with them. Um, and most recently on uh, Twitter, there's been this whole community of people who have been using plotters to make art. And they're really beautiful and really interesting to look at. And they hold a lot of fascination for a lot of us. Um, and what uh, I, I personally did not realize when I first discovered Plotter Twitter was that plotters actually have a very, very long history. And uh, it spans at least 60 years. So for those of you who are maybe of a more recent generation, you might not have seen or interacted with plotters before this recent reemergence. Um, but there's actually a lot of interesting things that plotters have been used for. And you know, they weren't always used for art. Uh, so take an example of this uh, ad for a uh, Calcom plotter. So Calcom is short for computer, uh, sorry, California Computer Products, and they were based in uh, Anaheim, uh, California, and they made plotters. They were really uh, good at making plotters, and they were really famous for it. Um, and the tagline in this ad is, teach your computer how to draw with a Calcom plotter. And uh, some examples of uh, applications that they mentioned here are, um, financial charts, or um, perspective drawings, or architectural drawings, and contour maps. And you know, today we have some examples of the plotter being used for maps. And this was in 1969, so a good 50 years ago. 60 years? Yeah. Um, and so to talk about plotters, we first need to talk about what computers were like back then. Because plotters are only, um, they still need to be sent instructions to perform uh, all these drawings. And the ones sending instructions to the plotter are computers. So this is uh, an example of a very early popular uh, computer. And it's the IBM 7090 data processing system. So it's not even called, like computer is called a data processing system because it's made of so many parts. Um, you need at least eight different uh, pieces of equi equipment to have a minimally functioning 
uh, IBM 7090. And you can see here in the back, um, you have your data in the form of magnetic tapes. And here, readers, you have console for control. And then here, I believe it's a uh, punch card reader. And this was introduced in 1959, um, 60 years ago. And uh, it, for the very cool price of only $3 million. <laughs> Back then, uh, today, it would be $20 million. So these were really, really expensive computers. Um, and they were mostly uh, you, available only in educational institutions, so like universities or research institutions, labs. And so the people who had access to these computers were mostly scientists, engineers, mathematicians, you know, academics. Um, and they were not really easily accessible. Uh, in fact, the IBM 7090 was uh, featured in Hidden Figures, which is a movie about the women behind uh, NASA sending uh, men to space. And uh, just to give you a perspective of what computers are used, like, was used for back then, you used to send people into space. Um, and it's a really great movie. If you haven't watched it, you should check it out. Um, and what was it like to write code to run on these computers? Uh, most of the time, the programmer wouldn't even be in the same room as the IBM 7090. Um, they would spend most of their time uh, working at a punch card writer, which looks something like this. Um, and you have a little keyboard, you would type up your little program, and uh, it will be output in the form of punch cards. You would take these punch cards, go to the computer lab, hand it over to someone behind the door, they would run it for you and give you back the results. Um, so there were multiple ways in which you could get uh, output from a computer. Uh, so example, I'm just going to run through a few examples. So you could get an idea of like, you know, what it was like back then to get graphical output. Um, one uh, option was the uh, cathode ray tube, CRT display. And this was mostly uh, in black and white. And sometimes they had dig digitizers or light pens that you could use to interact with. So example of it in use here. Um, and then there were, of course, uh, drum printers or line printers that had a fixed set of characters, and they were impact printers, so you, this weren't really great for graphical output. It's more for text or database output. Um, and then there was something called electronic or microfilm plotters, and the term plotter here is used really differently from the plotters that we see today, but I think are really important, and um, we don't see these anymore compared to printers and also CRT displays. So the way that... Uh, microfilm plotters will work is that you, instead of having like mechanical arm that draws, you had a CRT tube here that will fire an electron beam at a microfilm film, and it will draw onto it, and you can take that microfilm and uh, produce copies or develop it or turn it into animations. And here we have an example of a very popular uh, microfilm recorder slash plotter, uh, the SC4020. And this actually had a very big role in the early history of computer graphics, and I'll show you a little bit later on. Um, and then, of course, we have the mechanical plotters. And here's an example of a really early Calcom plotter um, that was introduced in 1959, the same year that the IBM 7090 was introduced. And it was a drum plotter. So uh, instead of having it, instead of um, the plotters that we've seen so far, which are flat bit, plot flat bit plotters that uh, lie on a flat surface, um, these had rolls of paper that could be um, installed into the plotter, and uh, up to, I believe, 120 feet, so you could uh, plot really long, continuous graphs or charts, and that's what it was really good for. Just a quick clip on how it worked. The pen would move on the x-axis, and then the drum would move backward and forward on the y-axis. So really cool stuff. And as I mentioned, this was mostly used for scientific and mathematical applications. Um, and they were designed for such, and that's why like, a lot of these um, forms of output like, mostly drew lines or shapes, you know, geometric geometrical um, figures, and it wasn't really designed for art. Um, some examples of use of computer graphics really early in the day was by Boeing, and uh, they uh, were the first to use computer graphics um, to create simulations. Um, here's an example of using computer graphics to create simulations of pilots in a cockpit to design like better cockpits for planes, and also uh, simulations of airports. Uh, here we have the uh, Seattle-Tacoma Airport, which is the first airport that was ever uh, simulated to be used in pilot trainings. And in fact, um, William Feder of the Boeing company who led these efforts actually coined the term computer graphics. It's kind of wild to think that, oh, Computer graphics hasn't always been around because everything that we do now with the computer is very visual. 
Um, Bell Labs in uh, New Jersey actually was one of the pioneers of computer graphics and art, and they actually made one of the very first computer-generated films, and I'm going to show it to you. So here it is. And <laughs> uh, this is really cool because it's a visualization of a satellite rotating around a globe. And this was revolutionary at the time because um, you may have been able to like, make, perform, perform the calculations for all the positions, but it wasn't so easy to visualize it. So plotters and also other display devices were really important and really magical because they took something that was invisible and made it visible to the human eye. And this was actually made using a microfilm plotter, the SC4020. So just a, that's a brief overview of you know, what the practical users are. And even though they were practical users, they yielded uh, graphics that were really interesting and really visually appealing in its own right. So what about art? Like, how were these devices actually used to make art, and how did that start? So with, when talking about art, especially art history, context matters a lot. And um, the reason why I say this is because you need to keep in mind that the people with access to plotters and computers were scientists, engineers, mathematicians. So a lot of the early art actually took on a lot of that nature. So I just want you to keep that in mind. And, to, and also, I'm going to give you an overview of uh, certain techniques that I've seen from all my research into early computer art. And I've chosen them uh, because I think they're interesting. There's a lot more work that's out there that's maybe really different. Um, so this is just like a distilled version of the parts that I think are really interesting. So, so uh, I'm going to talk uh, about a few types of art I've seen. Uh, the first being fractals. Um, and then uh, some emergent patterns. I've chosen like this set of emojis to mean like very specific things. Uh, so <laughs> I appreciate them. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about optical art, which is, might make your eyes swim, but you know they're really cool. And uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, color and texture was uh, created using uh, plotter technology back then. So let's start with fractals. So fractals. Um, we see them in real life. Here's a cool Romanesco broccoli, a fern, and uh, Sierpinski's triangle. And some of you might already be familiar with fractals. I might have seen them you know, in nature or in math. And uh, I like to think of fractals as infinitely complex patterns that are self-similar across different scales. And um, I like to use this one example of a uh, fractal called the co snowflake to illustrate this concept. So, you start off with a curve, and um, what you can do is that, uh, it's a really simple curve, it goes like this, 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 that. And you can take each edge of that curve and replace it with smaller versions of itself. And you do that repeatedly over and over again, and you notice the pattern becoming more and more intricate and more complex, uh, but self-similar. So if you, look, if you zoom in to each edge, it looks like the overall shape. You put three of them together, and it looks like a snowflake. Um, and so the idea of fractals is really fascinating because you have simple rules that can result in interesting, um, intricate patterns. Um, here are some examples from uh, 1969 and 1971 of the use of fractals in plotter art. Uh, we have here some art that is inspired by uh, floral patterns. And also on the right here, there is one that is inspired by uh, the dragon curve, which is a type of fractal. So that's really cool. But there was one I found that I was really fascinated by um, that looked like a space filling curve. And uh, this was called Stained Glass Window. And it was submitted by an unknown artist at the US Army Ballistics Research Lab. So I just imagine, like, you know, there's, there's this one engineer at the US Army Ballistics Research Lab that had access to this $3 million computer. And one day just sat down and said, you know what, I'm going to make something fun. <laughs> and this is the result. We don't know who made it, um, it was submitted anonymously. And this was actually the second place winner in the first ever informal computer art, com, uh, computer art uh, competition that was held by Computers and Automation, which was one of the leading publications at that time. You can think of it like the Wired of today. Um, and the winner uh, of the first place was the one on the left here, but I think the fractal is more interesting. Uh, <laughs> this is 1963. Um, and these were some of the very first few people who figured out that you can use computers to make art. So uh, one of the things that's like kind of fun to think about is that when you look at these really old um, pieces of computer art, so try to figure out like how they were made. And this is a fun process, even if maybe it's been really it's been discovered or if you've seen something that's like a commonly known uh, pattern. But it's like nice to just sit and look at it and like 
you know, just think about like, oh, how did, how did you get there? It's kind of cool. So I'm just going to walk through um, one of my reverse engineering processes when I was uh, trying to reverse engineer this. And um, I know for a fact that it's a fractal because in one of the descriptions it said that it was based off the principle of the snowflake curve, which was the co-snowflake example that I just, sh I just showed you. So I noticed that you have this idea of um, a center square and you have a recursive pattern that goes outwards from each corner. And you can see it recursing all the way to the uh, edge. And also notice that um, each uh, corner has a curve that is repeated from each side. Um, and um, these are like, uh, they look like scepters, I'm just gonna call them scepter curves. Um, the contrast is a little low, so you can't see the overlay on it right now, but if you look at the screens on the side, you can see them. Um, and, but I noticed that it's not always the case that each corner of the curve is closed. Like in the second iteration over here, uh, three of them are closed, but there's a third, uh, sorry, there's a fourth that is open. And um, any descendant of that fourth corner uh, actually has only two closed corners and two open. So I was like, okay, that's kind of interesting. So putting all of that together, um, <laughs> these are some attempts I tried. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's a process of, of uh, debugging. And uh, some really messy JavaScript later, I finally recreated it in SVG. Uh, so it, it looks really cool with white and black. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, the code is a mess, don't, don't, don't look at it. <laughs> it is open source though, I'll, I'll send it out later. Um, but yeah, so the idea of like, you know, uh, trying to figure out like this, what this engineer uh, like 60 years ago was doing, sitting down like trying to, you know, create this really interesting pattern was doing. Um, and I feel like there might be a more elegant solution to this because it looks a lot like a lot of space filling curves I've seen. Um, so, you know, maybe you can figure out like other ways to generate this pattern. Uh, another type of art that I see a lot is uh, emergent patterns, and I just chose one to demonstrate, but there's a whole ton of them. Um, and emergence, uh, let me just define emergence. It is the condition of an entity having properties that its parts do not have due to the interaction among the parts. So the way I like to think of it is that, oh, the final result doesn't look like the parts that it's made out of, and it could have like really interesting uh, unexpected effects. Uh, so an example that I really like are these. And if you look at them, you can see like, oh, well, the, the most uh, obvious shape that you see are these spades and curves and the different densities of lines where they are closer to one another. So, and um, if you look even closer, uh, you realize that these are actually made out of triangles. So in each, uh, it's just a way in which tr the triangles are arranged are different, but the base shape is actually just a triangle um, with nested triangles that are rotated just a little bit every time. Um, and uh, I know this is a really common theme that was used over and over again, um, and even up to today, I still see this being used, and it held a lot of fascination for people, um, and on the right here, I just want to point out cybernetic serendipity is, this is a poster, and their aesthetic was like this um, spiral, and uh, cybernetic serendipity was an exhibition in 1967 that was the first ever exhibition that took computer art and presented it to the public in a way that said, hey, this is art made with computers. And it was revolutionary at the time. Uh, so if you're interested in you know, computer art history, you should definitely check it out. It was organized by a woman uh, named Jasia Reichardt, who is a Polish uh, curator and writer, uh, and this was held in London. Uh, so a lot of early computer art that was surfaced was actually exhibited at this uh, exhibition. Um, and so the idea of this pattern is that you start off with a shape and you uh, maybe like shrink it and rotate it a little bit and nest it inside, do it over and over again, and eventually you get this pattern which is made out of curves that doesn't look like the geometric shape that it was formed out of. And I later found out um, in uh, Jesse Reichardt's book that this was actually a visualization of a problem in calculus called the four bucks problem. And so I'm gonna let you read it, but also um, just to give you an idea, imagine you have a square table and you put one bug on each corner, and uh, each bug really wants to be friends with the other bug, so it chooses the bug on its right and moves towards it at the same rate as every other bug, and they get closer and closer. And the problem calculus is to find the path of each or the distance traveled for each bug. Um, and I, 
this was like a really nice way to think about it versus thinking of it as just like, oh, take the shape, shrink it, rotate it. Like that feels like more math than, than this. Um, and so uh, knowing that it's really easy to visualize this using modern day tools, and you can do that with any number of bugs because now you can run it on the computer, so you can like, you know, have six or seven, and it's fine. Um, but my personal preference is actually seeing it tiled, and this is really cool because of the spade-like shapes. This is from triangles, these are from uh, squares, and these look like mushrooms. <laughs> and um, they behave in a way that you do not expect. Like just reading the math problem itself is not gonna, uh, it's not gonna bring this image to mind. So it's really cool to see things visualized. Um, and they turn out to be really versatile and they were used a lot in early computer art. Um, so if you can just tile a, a geometric shape and perform that same operation, um, then you can, it also adds like uh, illusion of depth, which is really interesting. And these are all, I think, triangle, made out of triangles, 1968 and 1967. On the left here was um, a poster, sorry, an example of uh, plotter art that was used to advertise the first um, computer plotter art competition held by Calcom in 1968. Uh, another type of art, last type I want to show you, is optical art. So optical art, uh, also called op art, is the style of visual art that uses optical illusions. Um, and they give you an impression of movement or, you know, like flashing or like waves or warping where uh, the image is static. Um, this was an era when optical art gained a lot of interest um, in the public eye. Um, no pun intended. Uh, and it was uh, well, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City that first created a exhibit of uh, optical art in 1965. And so a lot of early computer artists actually got inspiration from uh, optical art. And you'll see some examples later. Um, but the idea is that you take something static, you arrange it in such a way, usually in black and white, that creates an illusion of movement um, at a very basic um, idea of it. And so as some examples, um, from 1971, here um, you have here on the left like waves that actually they almost look like they're moving, uh, and on the right here you have this illusion of like 3 dness that's made out entirely uh, with lines within uh, circles and ellipses. And uh, my favorite type of optical art are actually Mori patterns. Uh, here's an example of each. And the idea of Mori patterns is that you have two very similar patterns, but not exactly the same overlaid on one on the other, and that gives you really interesting uh, patterns that uh, look almost like ripples. Um, and because plotters can plot on multiple different types of surfaces, you can, you can plot them on um, translucent surfaces and overlay them uh, and put them in, the, in a box to create like more patterns in the more, uh, with more depth. And this is an example of it, of an uh, exhibit I think that was at Cybernetic Serendipity. Um, and sometimes even using something really simple like sine waves, overlaying them can create really interesting effects that you don't expect to see. Um, I played a little bit of this, um, but I think there's a lot of, uh, it's, it's something that it's fun to play with because you don't expect it to behave that way and it still has fascination even up to today. If you go to Plotter Twitter um, and just look through like the kind of work people do, there's a lot of Mori art and um, it's still, it's still like, I don't know, we just, we just, we just, are so fascinated by this effect. I also want to show you some work uh, that use color and textures because remember when I talked about CRT displays or printers, you only really had two colors, black and white. Um, and having a plotter that allowed you to um, use any type of ink or paper that you want like brought a whole load of options um, in terms of color and texture. And so an example here, um, done on a graphomat plotter in 1967 that is also a math visualization of matrix multiplication um, by Frederick Naka. And uh, it's really, I, I really like this because of the way that the colors bleed into one another that really looks like watercolor and has this very, like, it, you can tell it's been drawn by a machine but it has the effect of uh, a very physical medium. Um, an early pioneer of computer art uh, was Grace Hartline and this is a couple of her works in 1970. And she, uh, Hart, uh, Hartline had a background in art, she was a professor of art, um, and she took inspiration from traditional art techniques to layer different types of inks and 
using different types of brushes to create depth of effect because you're working with only lines and that gives you know, a lot of early computer art very, very one-dimensional feel. So you've got to be really creative in deciding how to create texture. And so on the left here, she used uh, nylon brushes and ink um, to create different layers of depth. And on the right here, it's still all using lines and pens, but like layering them in different ways creates uh, different sort of textures that's really interesting to look at. Uh, so I like her work a lot because it um, took a different approach that was from the world of art and applied that to a technical tool. I tried playing a little bit with textures as well. Um, haven't gotten very far in it, so I'm happy to hear if people have thoughts or ideas on how to create interesting textures with just lines. So before I end, I want to answer this question of, um, or rather discuss uh, why you know, why is history important and why, why do we bother with it? Why do we bother going back and looking at all these like, black and white drawings and um, old computers and old machines? Um, and I kind of landed on this idea that, you know, just because something has been done doesn't mean that it's easy, doesn't mean that it was easy, and it doesn't mean that it was uninteresting. Um, I feel like in tech, we are so focused on chasing the next new thing or the next shiny thing, and we're in such a rush to create things that uh, seem new, exciting, that we forget that tech actually has a history. It's not very long, but it is a history. And understanding what has been done will help us create better work, uh, to be more creative, and to um, respect the ones that have come before us. And I, have, I had like a very interesting experience uh, on Twitter recently that kind of demonstrated um, this fact here, that just because it's done doesn't mean it's easy. <laughs> so. Uh, I found this piece by uh, Edward Zajac, which was the one who created the first um, uh, computer animation that I showed you. Uh, and I know for a fact that this was done using an IBM uh, computer with a Calcom plotter in, I think, 1967. And um, so remember how plotters can only draw lines, right? Um, so uh, with that in mind, uh, Looking at this piece, you notice there's two different major components, the elements in the foreground and the lines in the background. So if you were drawing this in, let's say, Photoshop or Paint, uh, you can just like, create the background and then like, layer things onto it to hide the parts that you don't want. So you can just do the you know, diagonal background and then add things on top, and that's good, easy. But if you're creating this with a plotter, uh, you need to tell the plotter somehow to not draw over the parts where you have your foreground objects. So if you have a line here that goes, you need to tell it, okay, don't draw a line here, but continue it here, and so on. So it's not an easy uh, problem to solve. Uh, it's not a trivial problem to solve. And so I asked Twitter, I was like, hey, Plata Twitter, great community, people are really, really uh, excited about this. Um, I have a question for you. How would you go about generating an SVG to recreate this piece? And so I got a whole bunch of answers. Uh, one suggestion was to use SVG masks. So you kind of mask the foreground subjects um, and to kind of block out the background. Um, uh, there were people who have built tools. Uh, there's a friend of mine who built uh, a game called Line Rider and used it uh, for its vector graphics to, uh, he used, I think, a ray casting technique to find the intersections of where the points are and to delete them. Uh, another person who also had a tool uh, called Turtle Toy that uh, did something similar where you found intersections and kind of got rid of the background lines in the foreground objects. There was someone who suggested that you could just load this into Inks Inkscape and trace bitmap, bitmap paths with you know, a brightness cutoff. And I was like, that, that, that technically that could work, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's like, mm, true. Um, and, and there was even someone who suggested that you could generate that image in 3D and then use this tool that turns 3D objects into vector art and plot that. Um, and that's a valid, that's a valid strategy too. Um, but it's like, I found it fascinating because this uh, graphic, uh, the original graphic, was a good 20 years before 3D graphics was invented. 3D graphics were commercially available, I think, in the 1980s. So it was you know, way before then. And uh, this told me a couple of things. The first is that there are so many ways to think about graphics today. There's so many options, so many things we can do to create the same effect. Um, and also the fact that you know, this is still an interesting problem. It's not trivial. Uh, it's worth thinking about. And it's, it's kind of fun to think about um, to see how we can create similar things using modern day tools. So yeah, I, I would say that um, there's a lot of really interesting art 
back in the day. You don't even have to go as, back as, as far back as like the 1960s. Um, but there are a lot of resources, and I've linked all my sources in the uh, source links. So if you want to check them out, see where they actually came from, uh, you can. Um, if you found this talk interesting, I'm writing a series of blog posts on the early history of computer art. And uh, so far, I'm like two parts in. The first part's computer graphics, second part's on plotters. So please check it out if you're interested or not. That's totally okay too, no problem, no, no pressure. <laughs> and this is my blog here. Um, I will post uh, all these links on Twitter uh, after this, but if you want like, a link to the slides, they're at the bottom here. It's a little hard to see, uh, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, that's all I have for you today, and if uh, you have any questions or uh, anything that you want to talk about, if you enjoyed this, if you did not, did not enjoy this, that's fine. You know, keep, keep in touch. I'm on Twitter. I'll also be hanging out around here after this, so uh, yeah, come and say hi. I'd love to meet you, and that's all.